To start our conference, we have a really special event this afternoon. Many of you will know about the Hearman Lecture Series that the university started. We're now in our fifth season of that lecture series that focuses on food security, natural resource security, agricultural production issues, uh, uh, rural landscape security broadly writ, where we bring leaders from around the world in the various subjects important in those areas to our campus to dialogue with us. The Hearman Lectures were enabled by the generosity of the Hearman family for which the lectures are named. Uh, we're very pleased, as is the case I think in every lecture, maybe but one, Keith has missed one of these in the last four years, to have Keith Hearman with us here today. Keith, if you would stand and be recognized and let us thank you for your support. <clears throat> The Hearmans have been longtime leaders in agriculture in the state of Nebraska and beyond, uh, from the Phillips, Nebraska uh, area, a rural place about uh, a, little over, a little over an hour, hour and a half west of us here in Lincoln. So Keith, thank you very much for your enormous generosity in helping us develop such a great lecture series. The lectures are live streamed. Today they're being live streamed on cable. Uh, and aired on NET, so we appreciate the opportunity to spread that uh, beyond the room that we're in here, uh, and I know today is going to be an exceptional one for all of us. So let me kind of introduce to you first our two speakers that we have joining us today. Uh, this is going to be very much a dialogue format, not a stand-up kind of lecture, but a dialogue amongst the three of us. Uh, we are extremely pleased to have for our lecture topic this afternoon, Finding Hope, Pioneering Your Own 40 Chances. Our two guests are uh, no strangers to many of us in the room here, uh, natives to Nebraska. First, Howard G. Buffett. He's the chairman and CEO of the Howard G. Buffett Foundation, immediately here on my right. A private family foundation working to improve the standard of living and quality of life for the world's most impoverished and marginalized populations. He's a farmer, businessman, philanthropist, photographer, many of us know about his photography, and former elected official. Howard has dedicated his life to addressing global food insecurity and conservation. He has traveled to 139 countries, documenting the challenges of preserving our biodiversity while providing adequate resources to meet the needs of a growing global population. Howard is a United Nations Goodwill Ambassador against hunger and serves on the corporate boards of Berkshire Hathaway, the Coca-Cola Company, and Lindsay Corporation. He operates a 1,500-acre family farm in central Illinois and oversees three foundation-operated research farms, including over 1,400 acres in Arizona, 4,000 acres in Illinois, and 9,200 acres in Southern Africa. Howard has written extensively on conservation, wildlife, and the human condition. 40 Chances, Finding Hope in a Hungry World, much of our topic today is surrounding this book that we'll talk about in a few minutes, documents the people, places, and experiences that have shaped his evolving views of the role of philanthropy in addressing the world's most difficult challenges. Please join me in welcoming Howard G. Buffett. And also joining us to my far right is Howard W. Buffett. Now you see what I'm, uh, the, the challenge I'm going to have in this dialogue. So uh, we decided I would sit in the middle and look at which Howard I wanted to talk to, to keep it simple. Uh, Howard W. Buffett is a lecturer here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, a uh, role he started with us last academic school year, and is a lecturer in international and public affairs at Columbia University in New York. He teaches management techniques for improving the effectiveness of foreign aid and global philanthropy. 
Howard also serves on the Board of Counselors for the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha and is currently a member of the UNL Chancellor Search Committee. Howard is a trustee of the Howard G. Buffett Foundation and previously served as the Foundation's Executive Director. Prior to joining the Foundation, he served in the U.S. Department of Defense, overseeing agriculture-based economic stabilization and redevelopment programs in Iraq and in Afghanistan. For his work, he received the Joint Civil C Civilian Service Commendation Award, the highest ranking civilian honor presented by the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the request and approval of the combatant commanders. Prior to that, Howard was a policy advisor for the White House Domestic Policy Council, where he co-authored the President's Cross-Sector Partnerships Strategy. He earned a BA degree from that institution in, in Evanston, Illinois, known as Northwestern University, and an MPA in Advanced Management and Finance from Columbia University. Uh, Howard currently lives in Omaha, where he and his father operate a 400-acre no-till farm, and he's joined today by his wife, Lily, and their new son, uh, who is, is uh, with them as well today. So please join me in welcoming Howard W. Buffett. I think many of you probably know about the 40 Chances book that was published in 2013 uh, by Howard as the author along with his son, Howard. And it talks about living in a world where you really have 40 chances to make a difference. And we're going to talk about where that, where that uh, moniker really came from, Howard, today. And it's based on, if you had the resources to do something great in the world, what would you do? How would you use those resources? How would you make a difference? Where are the needs for making that difference? So what we're going to try to do in the next 40 minutes or so is just to kind of dialogue about some of the things that are the learnings in this book, some of the, the observations that both Howard and Howard have had during their lifetime of philanthropy, and I think they have some great challenges for us to consider, including how we think about rural futures in this conference over the next couple of days. So Howard, got it? <laughs> yeah, that's got right. It? <laughs> I think that's kind of cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Would you kind of explain for us the origin of the 40 chances? We uh, start our book tour. I'll get to your question in a minute, but but and and it, it talks about forty chances and 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 why that's important. It, it mindset is what it really is. And we would do it. We started in New York, and my dad went with us to kick it off. And every time I would say that you really had forty chances in your life, you give me this very dirty look. And it was like I think I have more than that. So you have to think about it. I, I learned to kind of not to take it too literally. You have to think about it. Um, more as a mindset, but basically I, I was going down, the farmers don't have that much to do in January or February. They always tell you that they have a lot to do, but we really don't. And so um, I went down to Sloan Implement, which is where I buy a lot of my uh, equipment, and they had this guy that was going to tell us how we could plant better. And I, th you know, every farmer thinks they know how to do everything right already, so I thought this would be interesting. And so he started out telling us that we really didn't uh, think about our business the right way and that we go out and we we plant and we spray and we fertilize and we harvest and we do these different things but we think about them in pieces and we just kind of blend them all together and he said what you really need to do is think about it in the terms that by the time your dad gets off the tractor and lets you get on it you probably are going to have 40 crops that you plant and I had never thought about it that way and I realized that that's not very many. And so you want to get it right. So it affected my farming a little bit. Um, but then technology fixed that, because I was thinking, you know, I got to get straight rows and then I got GPS, so it fixed that problem. But anyway, <laughs> most problems aren't that easy to fix. So essentially, I started thinking about, you know, your life is a lot like that. By the time, by the time you really get through school, you get enough experience that you're, you know, um, 
better at making judgments and better at making decisions, you know, you might have 40 really solid years of doing what you're going to do. And that's not that long. So the bottom line is you need to think about that life has a certain amount of urgency to it. And I don't think in a lot of the places where we work, there's not enough urgency to trying to solve the problem. So the 40 chances really came out of planting school uh, in one February and kind of changed my mindset about how I look at some things. So your, your dad wrote the forward to the book and he describes you as a force of nature. He also describes you as the Indiana Jones of his field. My mother had He's, other descriptions that weren't so nice. Said your only speed is fast forward. He also says in this ovarian lottery, my children receive some lucky breaks. What was it like growing up the oldest son of Warren Buffett? And how did that influence your thinking about philanthropy? Well, the, the greatest thing is we didn't have to worry about much. I mean, you know, we didn't, and, and the other thing is that Warren Buffett was not a household name, you know, for the most part of when I was growing up. I mean, it, it started to change a little bit in junior high school and a lot more the last few years in, in high school. But, but, you know, people didn't know who he was and he hadn't quite done everything that he'd done today at that point. And so um, it wasn't nearly the amount of impact that probably some people uh, imagine. The, the great thing about it was, you know, we did have every advantage, and um, my mom and dad both not just spoke about, but, but, but really lived in a way that they gave back a lot to the community, and they really believed in that. And so we, didn't, we, we learned it as much by watching uh, as we did being told, which is a much more powerful way to learn something. And, that can be good and it can be bad. But I mean, you know, in this case, it, it was a great learning experience for us. And, and they had high expectations. My mom and dad both had high expectations of all three of us kids being productive citizens and giving back to our community in whatever way we could do that. And then later, when, when the foundation was created, um, they gave us some, some serious, eventually some serious financial resources to do that. So, I mean, that's really, I think, where it comes from is just growing up in that environment. You talk a lot about your mom in the book too. And you, you say that a lot of your wisest and most insightful friends and colleagues and advisors would be women. Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> well, this can get me in trouble with all the men, but um, uh, no, I, I've just found that, and, and it's true when you work in rural areas in poor countries, I think you really see what, what, what women are capable of and what they focus on. And a lot of times it's much better than what men focus on. And, you know, they put their family first. Um, they will sacrifice for their kids. And it doesn't mean that, that husbands and men don't do that. Um, but women have a different way of solving problems and they have a different way of of kind of analyzing things. I mean, there's some things they're not as good at as men, but women tend to um, really add a lot of value when, when you're trying to solve problems. So they just, you know, w women have been very influential in my life, but they've been, and they've been very helpful. And I think, you know, if, if you look at a lot of parts in the world, and, and certainly women have made a lot of progress in this country, but not enough. But if you look at a lot of parts in the world, women are really put in bad circumstances and they're underappreciated, they're not treated fairly. Um, and when I look at that, I think, look at the resources you're missing. Look at the, the, the missed opportunities of including a big part of your population that has a lot to offer. You know, we have some students sitting here from Rwanda, and if you look at Rwanda, I, it may be one of the only countries in the world that has over 50% of its parliament are women. Um, it makes a big difference uh, in terms of how, how the outcome is reached if you include all of the population with men and women versus you know, uh, having it out of balance when women aren't uh, part of the equation equally. And so I think it, it, it's, a, it's been a big factor in my life. So Howard. 
You started traveling, as is talked about in the book, with your dad when you were 13. Mm -hmm. How did those kind of early experiences traveling together impact you? Uh, well, in, uh, in a lot of ways, um, as may be obvious. I mean, I would say probably first and foremost, um, it allowed me to develop a relationship with my father that I think um, maybe few sons get to really have. You know, I mean, we really were able to travel the world together uh, and see things and analyze things and struggle with things together that I, mean, I think, you know, it's not always uh, the opportunity that folks have. And so that was a very unique um, uh, opportunity for us to be able to bond in that way and sometimes maybe closer than uh, that we would have liked. If you think back to Vietnam. I have a few stories. <laughs> yeah, we have, yeah, we can reference a couple places that maybe where that was a little too close. But, um, but nonetheless, you know, that was a very unique thing. And I think, um, I think it was important that he and I shared that connection because uh, one of the things that I, I ended up missing out on as a result of that was having a, a tight peer group back home. When we had moved to Illinois when, uh, before I went to high school, and uh, a lot of folks that I went to school with couldn't quite relate to some of the stories I was bringing back home uh, from these places that we were going to. They'd, you know, they'd certainly never seen it in, in real life and, and maybe sometimes seen some of these things on TV and, and usually not in, in the extremes that we were seeing you know, firsthand. And so I think the other thing is, is that beyond the connection that we were able to share, it, it really pushed me to connect with other people when we were out traveling and, and exposed me to dozens, if not hundreds, of, difference of uh, differences of kinds of cultures uh, from all over the world that, that you could imagine. And so I think that I, I, I like to credit the fact that, that we spent that time traveling and it allowed me to have <coughs> effectively no judgment on any person's culture or, or life choices that they've made. So I think that was a big factor as well. And then. I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, starting that at the age of 13 uh, is a very interesting age to start exposing someone to, um, to both a combination of the beauties around the world. I mean, we had some amazing trips to Brazil and, and, and to India where you would see some of the most beautiful scenes you could imagine. And, um, but also some of the, the most horrific scenes that you can imagine in terms of abject poverty. And I think one of the things that it led me to do, is, as a lot of children do uh, at that age, is to start questioning it and to be uh, very inquisitive and to really ask why. Why is there so much needless suffering around the world? Why are there so many people living in these conditions that later on you, you tend to understand are because, well, there's other people that made some probably pretty selfish or unwise decisions earlier down the line that have led to those life conditions that they're in. And that's not always the case, but it definitely happens a lot. And so part of what we wanted to explore in 40 Chances was to go and start digging deeper into why are there so many people who are living in these conditions that really don't have to be. Now, I'm going to tell you the, the, the way the book really happened. Um, I was sitting, we were all in Arizona doing something, getting ready to have a board meeting or something. And, and uh, I said, you know, I've been around a, a lot, and maybe it would be useful to write a book for students, you know, that they could use at school and just <clears throat> learn some of the things we've learned rather than having to learn them, you know, another way. And Howie says, Dad, you're not thinking big enough. And that, that's one of the few times he could say that to me. Usually yeah, sure. I think too big. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually the origin of the book was then, well, then what do we do? And yeah. we ended up, you know, it took a while, but we got it done. <laughs> So you started your foundation focused on conservation, and I know that's an area that's, that's deep for both of you. Today you're focused on food, water, and conflict. That seems like a little bit of a shift. Um, what, what happened there? Well, in 1992, there was a, a guy I was visiting with. I was over at ADM at the time, and, and uh, he was kind of giving me a hard time about being so focused on conservation. and and. Uh, he said one line to me I, that, that changed how I looked at a lot of things eventually. He said, no one will starve to save a tree. And at the time, I didn't quite get the impact of that. And then I thought, well, every time I go, you know, to the Serengeti or the Mara or South Africa or something, I, I to take pictures of the cheetahs or whatever I'm doing, I, I'm going to look around a little, a little wider, a little broader, and stop in, and you know, just stop in, but I mean, make an, uh, find a way to get to some of the villages that are out in the really rural areas and, and try to visit with people. And I learned that um, the cheetah to us might be, wow, this is an amazing animal and you get these great pictures, but a cheetah to them or a lion or something else, you know, any predator was actually a serious problem for them. And I know that sounds simple, but, but you know, it, it, was a, it made me realize, well, if we don't take care of people, 
we aren't going to have to worry about the environment because we won't have one to worry about. And so in 1997, I went to Uganda to see the mountain girls for the first time. And when we drove up through those villages to get to the park, to the windy, um, there were people who threw rocks at us, they spit at us, they yelled names at us, and I didn't understand them, but um, they weren't very happy. And that really made me realize that there's a, this, this is a lot deeper issue, um, and a lot of people want to treat it on the surface, because if you treat it on the surface, you can have success. If you treat it on the surface, you can feel good about what you're doing, and, and, and you can walk away from it at some point. When the truth is, it's very, very deep-rooted with very, very challenging um, solutions, and sometimes there aren't good solutions. And so that really had an effect that trip did on me. And so I just started to understand that, that you can focus on conservation, and you can do a lot of cool things and get a lot of great pictures and do all these other things. But, but the truth <laughs> is that focusing on conservation means you're ignoring the largest single element which is a human being that is going to have the biggest negative impact on our environment. And you can't get away with that forever. So it really came around to me. And today, basically, a lot of what we work on, I would say, is all of it. Because on some of our work, particularly in, in Eastern Congo and DRC, it is very much tied into trying to preserve the park, which is Africa's oldest park and one of the few places you can see mountain gorillas the size of Rwanda and Uganda. So, um, it really kind of brought us around full circle where we're really working on all of those issues. So we talked about in the introduction, you have farm that you started with many years ago here in Nebraska and Howard, you're now working with your dad in and in Illinois and Arizona and Southern Africa. How, how has what you've learned from your own farming background in Nebraska and Illinois helped you in the other parts of the world? Well, it's maybe realize that we can't think like we think here and go do it somewhere else in most cases. Um, and it's amazing because I, I did a few experiments over the last 10 or 15 years and I'd send a few American farmers, uh, U.S. farmers over somewhere and they'd come back and I remember one guy went to Zambia and he says, well, they need anhydrous. Mm -hmm. And I thought, really? Mm -hmm. You know, you got to have natural gas, you got to have a business, yeah. you got to have all this stuff. And th th those are the kind of ideas that don't work, and they're the kind of thinking that you can build things, and then, and then they don't work because you don't have the rest of the infrastructure or the knowledge base or the training to go with it. And that's just one example, but it's one very clear one. And so, you know, one thing I learned is, you know, the huge advantage is that all farmers face similar problems. Now, you may have different resources to overcome those problems, but you know, it's insects, it's drought, it's too much water, it's, you know, a bad hybrid, it's whatever it is um, that makes you have to deal with something that whether you're in the United States or whether you're in, you know, some other part of the world, you're dealing with a lot of the same issues. Now, you have very different resources. So that part of it is a plus because you begin to understand and learn as you, as you become more, uh, as you get more experience in agriculture, what some of those are. But, but the thing that I think is the most important to understand that a lot of it doesn't just transfer. You just can't, we're doing this project in Rwanda that, that scares the heck out of me. We are putting in 63 pivots on 1,280 hectares with 2,000 farmers. Think of that. You're gonna have a pivot with 60 farmers under it. Now you gotta come, you gotta put a cooperative together to talk about what crops you grow, then you gotta figure out how you're gonna market it, you gotta figure out how you're gonna manage the water, the maintenance, all these things. Nobody's tried this that I know of before, not at this scale, um, so it's a little scary to figure out, or, you know, as, because we're gonna have to solve problems as we go. It isn't like we have, there's no book that says this is how you do it. So, you know, we're good at trying things like that, and sometimes we make it work. We have to make this one work. Um, but it, it's really taking on the, the, the challenges and realizing that they have to be very country specific, culture specific, environment specific, and you can't cheat on that. You have to understand that diversity is what changes the risk profile for a small farmer and you can't take that away from them. Um, and you have to understand 
that they don't have credit like we have, they don't have infrastructure like we have, they don't have transportation like we have. So how do you solve those problems without thinking like a Western U.S. farmer? And um, so that's some of what I've learned from that. So last week, and I know you were, were part of it again, like you often are, was the World Food Prize in Des Moines, which is kind of the, the Nobel Prize of agriculture, so to speak, um, named for Norman Borlaug, who is known as the father of the Green Revolution, uh, helped to, to revolutionize agriculture in India, in particular in the 1960s, through new seeds, you know, development of, of agriculture around technology and helping to employ technology. In the book, you talk about the need maybe for there being a brown revolution instead of the green revolution, as we've thought about it. What, talk about that. Well, one of the best secrets about Norman Borlaug was that he was a huge believer in no-till. He realized that you can't continue to destroy your soils and think that you can continue to be productive. So what happens in every case that I've seen, and it certainly has happened in this country. Well, I will take it back. It hasn't happened in Argentina and Brazil. Um, and I'm still trying to figure all that out, but there's some reasons that make sense to me. But, you know, people do what's easiest. They do what works the best with the least amount of work. And so if you go look at the easiest way to increase productivity when you're growing 30 bushels an acre, get some better seed, might be OPV, might be hybrid, um, throw on a little fertilizer, and you can triple your yields. So that's great, except in Africa, you have around 70% of all the soils already degraded. You started uh, many millions of years ago in Africa with much less of a quality soil base across the entire continent than other places received. There, there's something we call, this can always be misinterpreted, the fertility belt. Um, and, and if you go 30 degrees north and you make a little jump up to 45 degrees north and you take that swath all the way around the world, you're growing 65% of the cotton, almost 60% of the corn, 45% of the soybeans, 45% of the wheat. You, you get my drift. It's in that little strip all the way around. It's the temperate climate zone pretty much. And there's not, if you look at it in Africa, it's like, it's like Algeria, Egypt, Libya, I mean, it, it, you don't get much out of that strip. So most of our research has been directed towards those crops. Rice is a good exception of that. There's only 20% grown in that strip, and that's grown you know, in a lot of other places. But we're, we, we think of agriculture as a science. The truth is there's a lot we don't know. We, we don't know nearly as much as we think we know some of the times. And so, you know, we have to be able to focus on, on where those crops work, but we also have to be able to focus on the solutions to places where they don't work. And so I think for us it's been um, a big challenge learning how to make that adjustment. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about risk. And you talk a lot about risk in the, in the book, risk of where you, where you put your chips what's going to pay off the, the best or you know, have the biggest, biggest impact. And you actually opened the book with a really vivid story about meeting a warlord uh, in the middle of the jungle in Africa. Uh, you write that you also like taking on risks that, that maybe others won't. So uh, why don't you talk a little bit about how you, how you think about risk in philanthropy and where you put your bets. Mm -hmm. Well, this is how screwed up my life is. Um, I'm planting soybeans in May, in, in, in May sometime a few years ago, and I get this phone call from a friend of mine, Shannon, and she says, Howard, I don't care what you're doing, but you need to get on an airplane tomorrow. You have to get here because they, they, they have um, captured the number two uh, general, Caesar Chellum, from the Lord's Resistance Army. You have to get over here because I want you to do something. Shannon. I'm planting soybeans. I said, I have to finish. And she said, then hurry up. That's like, well, I don't have that <laughs> option. I just, you know. So I uh, called Ann, who works for us. I said, Ann, go get two sleeping bags at uh, Kmart or somewhere, wherever. 
Uh, we're going to leave tomorrow for Africa. We're going to go up to Central Africa, Republic, and South Sudan, and we're going to sleep at the forward operating base. I don't know anything more than that. We're just going to go. And um, so that's basically what we did. And we didn't know what we were walking into, but that's not that unusual for me. Um, and for me, it's just it's an opportunity to really see what's happening and how it's happening and who's doing what to who. And, and what the outcomes are, and that helps me figure out what is it that we can do, or what shouldn't we do. And so, you know, I, I, I go play, I was, you know, two weeks ago, we, we had to apply to the uh, Treasury Department, State Department has to approve it to take armored vest rifle plates over to Congo because of where we were going at the time. And um, I don't think twice about it, and that's, probably why my wife thinks I'm a little nuts, but um, you know, I, I don't, I just think you go where you need to go to see what you need to see to understand what you have to understand. And if that's dangerous, that doesn't stop me from doing it. Uh, there are places and things that I don't do um, occasionally. Um, but you know, we went down to El Salvador about two months ago and went into the high security prison and sat and talked to the top MS-13 leaders for a couple hours, and those prisons are pretty much controlled by the gangs. So you go in there and you're not sure you're gonna come out, or you're not sure what's gonna happen, but there's only one way I can talk to these guys, and that's to go do it. I can't do it any other way. I can't understand what these guys think or what they're trying to tell the world, which half the time is, they have their own agenda in how they tell it, but, but I mean, I can't do that any other way. I can't get it in a book. I can't watch TV. I want to go do it. So I don't let risk stop me from doing things to learn um, in most cases. And I think for us as a foundation, risk means something a little different, which is we are really, in my opinion, the risk capital, the best risk capital there is in philanthropy. It's a huge mistake that more foundations don't think of it this way. And I don't mean that as a lecture. Those foundations have done a lot of good work and will continue. But most private family foundations are accountable to the IRS, period. They don't have a bureaucracy. They don't have to have a big board if they don't want to. They can make decisions quickly. I make, I make $10 million decisions in 30 seconds sometimes. Um, so why wouldn't we take our money and go to the toughest places in the world and be willing to fail. You have to fail to learn how to succeed. The problem is when people are afraid to fail, they look for safe bets and they don't take risk and, and then they feel good about what they've done. And that's a mistake in, our, in, the, in the area that we operate. So risk to me is something that should just go hand in hand with the kind of philanthropic dollars that we have and other foundations have. And I think it's just, it, it's a missed opportunity when we don't do that. So, well, I was gonna say, if you don't mind, yep, you know, go ahead. risk is also a tricky thing. So first of all, I think, um, well, obviously my dad and I think similarly on that. I mean, they hit the nail on the head in terms of philanthropic dollars being the ultimate risk capital. Uh, but risk is also a tricky thing in the sense that when you look at a lot of the areas where our foundation operates, uh, countries that have been in conflict recently or are currently in active conflict, uh, you have a lot of challenges because all of a sudden programs can inherently become a lot less efficient, especially programs that are focused on, on foreign aid through government programs and otherwise. Uh, so essentially, um, you've got a 200% increase in the likelihood that there will be uh, severe hunger in a, any country that's been in a civil conflict in the last 10 years. And you also have uh, the compounding factor that ongoing periods of hunger lead to an increased likelihood in conflict, right? So you've got uh, this mitigating cycle, or sorry, this uh, continuing cycle that becomes very challenging throughout time. And one of the graphs that we use in the, uh, in the class that I teach here at UNL shows that um, as the World Food Price Index goes up, so when we talk about what hunger does to affect potential for conflict and risk, as that food price index goes up, the incidences of conflict that are breaking out all over the world just explode. And you can look at it, and you can chart it out, and it's a very fascinating uh, thing to look at. And we use it because it's a really important tool to talk about how you've got to have agricultural development and food assistance under control in a lot of these places to mitigate enough risk to not have ongoing conflict. Um, and I could go on for another 10 minutes on this, but again, it's another big challenge when you look at operating 
uh, potentially government-funded programs. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, only five to ten percent uh, of funding that's intended to help impoverished individuals directly reach those individuals in a typical uh, government-funded program. Only five to ten percent, for a lot of reasons. And one of those reasons is, is you've got a lot of challenges when you're in a climate with a high level of risk and a lot of inefficiencies that come in. Uh, that make that challenging as well. Now, Ronnie, I'm not trying to hijack you, but I, I got to say something here because I, I think it's really to the core of the, of, of the issue of risk and, <clears throat> and being willing to take risk. When you go into conflict areas, everything is different. So we met with a warlord once in Somalia who was a real warlord in Black Hawk Down, and um, Shannon was with me then. And she nudges me and she says, don't get your picture taken with this guy. He's like, you're a really yeah. bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, anyway, we're talking to him and he says, yeah, you guys are pretty foolish. And I, and I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, we got this refugee camp set here and a refugee camp set here. We got a refugee camp set here. We put our people in this camp to bring everything. And we let you know there's a problem in this camp. We move the people from here to there. Then we move from here to there. And, and, and so it's a game. And so... When you look at what Howie's talking about in terms of, uh, uh, of the government aspect and the conflict aspect, nothing is easy. I had a, a, a guy from the SPLA that I had, uh, well, he was drinking beer, I was drinking Coke. It was much better he was drinking the beer because he talked more. And <laughs> so, you know, he started telling me this story about how these guys would surround a village and then get the word out. And you've got 500 people. You've got landmines around the village, so no one will walk out. They can't get water. They can't get wood. They can't get anything. And so they learned that if they would only take 30%, roughly, more or less, of the food aid that was dropped, then they would keep, it would work. It worked. They'd keep dropping food aid so they could get 30%. So someone has to make that decision, knowing that the militia groups are getting that 30%. But if you don't give it to them in the sense of letting them, well, I mean, they take it by their own, but then you have this whole village that's gonna starve to death. And one last thing, as we looked at conflict areas, and this is, this is really funny because um, you would never think of this. I don't, th I don't think you would ever think of this except we work, there's this great guy, Ed Price, at Texas A&M. Sorry, I know they beat us in football all the time. <laughs> um, but he's worked a lot with us on, in conflict areas, and he, they came back at one point and said, here's what you need to do. You need to focus on conflict crops. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you can burn a maize field down, cornfield. Um, you can destroy soybeans easily by just dragging something through it and busting all the pods open. But you can't really destroy a cassava field or a groundnut field or, you know. So, so we started working on this whole new concept of conflict crops. So when you think about conflict, whether it's the warlord who's taking advantage of, of people who aren't catching on to what he's doing or it's somebody who's taking advantage of food aid in the distribution process or whether it's figuring out how people can survive conflict in, in, in where they live because you give them better ideas. You know, all of that's, that conflict is a complicated business and it's risky. And so I just, I just wanna throw that conflict part in there because I think oftentimes it's something we think about, we maybe read about, but when you're really there seeing it and you understand, you know, how challenging it is, you have to get creative about solutions. And so that's that on conflict. Sorry, I hijacked. <laughs> Yo, no, that's okay. So you, you referred to earlier a couple of times Rwanda, and we have a number of Rwandan students uh, here with us today. You're, you're doing a lot of work there in that particular country. Why? Why, why Rwanda? Well, we're, it, it's interesting because we're doing more work in North Kivu and Democratic Republic of Congo, which shares the border which has a long history of, of conflict going back over 20 years, uh, back and forth with Rwanda in different ways. Um, and so what we're trying in the DRC is something in one of the most difficult places in the world to work with one of the most, um, it has no real established rule of law. It's got the longest standing uh, UN um, Blue Helmet group there and is very difficult. Rwanda is the exact opposite. Um, 
I got my permanent residency in South Africa in 2005. I, I, we've worked in 44 countries on the continent. I've been to every country on the continent. I've, I've seen a lot of Africa. It doesn't make me an expert, but, but it, what it allows me to do is observe. There is no country on the continent of Africa that functions as well as Rwanda. It is the exact opposite of a Zimbabwe or Eastern DRC or, some, or, or Somalia. And so we work, we've worked in all those countries. We continue to work in some of them. But I wanted to try a bigger idea that was going to be a lot of money for us. And to do that, I could not go anywhere other than Rwanda because I had to have solid, dependable, reliable government functions and processes. I had to have uh, rule of law. I had to know that we would be treated fairly. I would have to know that if we didn't agree with something, we could at least sit down with reasonable people and discuss it. Um, and we had to know that the people in the country would embrace change. So to me, we looked at we, we looked at a lot of things to start what we're starting there with agriculture, but, and, and, and we know most of the, a lot of the countries, not most of them, but a lot of countries on the continent. And Rwanda provides reliability and stability and predictability in a way that no other country provides it. And, and the hope, and one of the reasons we're working in DRC is there's still a group there, the FDLR, who were responsible in many ways for a large part, it's, very complicated, so this is oversimplifying it, but um, that we're very involved in the genocide. Uh, you have the ADF there who would like to overthrow Uganda. You, you have all these different things going on in Eastern Congo. It's this little, it's this one little spot, and you have more. You probably have 40 different armed rebel groups in that one area. So when you look at Rwanda and you look at the future, you have to believe that they can protect their own borders and they can develop a more democratic process and that they will, they will be able to preserve the kind of process and government and, 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 and integrity that they have uh, in those processes now. And there's a lot of challenges for Rwanda. This is not a cakewalk. <laughs> I mean, this is not easy. There's, there's a lot of people that want to see President Kagame fail. There's a lot of people who want to see the country fail. Um, and so it's not easy, but it is the one country that I feel we have the best shot at having success in. So Howard W., <laughs> you, you know, we've talked a little bit about you teaching the class here and you referred to it earlier in one of your comments. Um, so what aspects of what's in 40 Chances uh, do you think the students find most interesting or learn from in your class or reflect on that? Sure. Well, um, well first, at, at Al, actually, Alan, Alan, this is, he needs cue cards. This yeah, I need cue one. cards. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, this is actually a perfect opportunity to, uh, to say thank you to, to UNL and to, uh, thanks to the Kasner team. I know Dean Waller and Tiffany and the groups here. And uh, thanks to you, Ronnie, as well, for, you know, giving me the opportunity to spend time with the students here uh, in Nebraska, which has just been a truly tremendous uh, opportunity for me and um, is just rewarding in, in ways that I could share afterwards because it's, uh, it's really an amazing student group that you have here at UNL. So I commend you for that uh, and, and really pleased that President Bounds is here as well because I'm really excited for what's going to um, be in the future of the, uh, of the entire university here looking forward. So, so, so that gives me a lot of hope um, and, and I've been really impressed uh, with the group that we have and we've got some former students in, in here as well, so you might be able to ask them afterwards. Um, a couple of things. I think one is there are a lot of ways that some of the stories and the anecdotes and 40 chances come through that you may not get by watching it on TV um, or by reading an article or a magazine, or, and certainly probably not by reading a, a standard textbook. And so I think it really helps bring some of this to life in a way that's unique and through an individual voice, most of the uh, time through my father's voice, that allows folks to see in and peer underneath what's going on in ways they don't otherwise have access to that. So I know that the students get excited about that. We have the opportunity to bring in a lot of guest speakers in our course as well who are profiled throughout 40 Chances. So, so my dad mentioned Ed Price. Uh, we had Ed uh, fly in and do a guest lecture uh, earlier uh, uh, this year. And, and just, again, the students with the opportunity to meet someone like that and to hear the stories and the work that Ed's been doing his whole life, whether it was in Afghanistan or in Iraq or whether 
it's in Ghana with the foundation, what we're doing, it doesn't matter. Again, it's, it's an opportunity to connect with someone and to learn their story in a deep way. And you know, I'll say finally with 40 Chances, I think um, we've organized the book in an interesting way. It's 40 short stories. Uh, and it's not spelled out like this, but as you go through the book and you read these stories, you really find that we're talking about three categories of things. We're talking about people whose work have really inspired us, like Ed Price or, or others. Uh, people who are, in a lot of cases, unknown heroes, names you've never heard of before, but who are dedicating their entire life and their entire career to making a difference for others. Uh, we also talk about places that, as I referenced before, a lot of students aren't getting exposure to, places that where we've tried to, to make a difference and maybe we failed and what we've learned from that, um, and, and places where there is a lot of hope and where a lot of progress has been made and that's important. And then the final kind of component of this is we talk about a lot of processes uh, in the world of philanthropy and donor aid, um, ones that don't work, we focus a lot on that, and then ones that do work in the ways that we think we can make the ones that don't work a lot better. And so you, you get a whole mosaic uh, of information and knowledge around international development and agricultural policy that, um, that I think the students get a real kick out of. Um, and again, I think I see Amanda here, and there's probably others that, uh, that you can talk to afterwards, because they're just, they have been absolute superstars. Amanda, Amanda you get an A now. I yeah, you, <laughs> she did get an A. But um, no, they're, they're really off the charts, the students here at UNL. So I, I can't commend what you've done you know, through INA or more. So. I'll, I'll tell you a little side note, and I'll well, grandstand a little bit here. Howard told me at the end of his first semester of teaching that he was more impressed with our UNL students than he was with the Columbia students. So I really like that. <laughs> really like wow, that. Wow, you won't be going <laughs> back really to like Columbia. That. <laughs> I can't admit that publicly. <laughs> <laughs> so so a, kind of a question for both of you. We'll kind of begin wrapping up our dialogue here so we can, can dialogue with the audience. Uh, and questions from the floor. So be thinking about things you might want to address to the Buffets. Uh, there'll be roving mics on the floor that will come to you and allow you to, to articulate Any a question. Any difficult question, just address it. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, no. so first kind of question for both of you to respond to. You, there are lots and lots of things you could have devoted your philanthropy to. You chose ag and food. Mm. Why? You said we chose agriculture. Yeah, ag and food. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, and I would say we've evolved a little bit to conflict mitigation, but um, I, you know, my dad, my dad always, from an early age, he would he would always say, "Now remember, stay in your circle of competence." And your circle of competence is very small. He would tell me, so <laughs> I knew I knew I had limitations, and and uh, so you know. I, I've had this incredible opportunity to be involved in agriculture and, and both from being on boards like ADM and ConAgra to um, farming myself. I mean, I got off the combine at, at 7.30 last night or 8 o'clock and, and I love that. And so, you know, I kind of, from, from one end to the other, I've had this opportunity. And, and so that's, that's my deepest, broadest base of knowledge. And so if I look at one of the biggest problems in the world, it's people who can't feed themselves. And when you meet farmers who have literally had children die because they could not provide food to them, you look at that and you think, that is absolutely, there's something wrong with that, okay? As a farmer, there's something wrong with that. So that just gets your attention as a farmer. And um, it is something that is very easy for me to engage in and get involved in. And then, you know, we've, we've gone different directions with it, but, but that's the basic reason why we're in agriculture. And conflict mitigation, we've done a lot in water, but the water, we, we decided we needed to really focus on how it impacts and how it integrates with, with agriculture. So we don't, we, don't do, we don't do things outside of water and agri that is related to agriculture. And conflict mitigation has just evolved because we started working in really tough countries and whether it's Burundi or Sierra Leone or Liberia a decade ago, they're coming out of conflict. Um, when you go to those countries and you meet people that have experienced just horrendous things in their life and you think, how can other people do this to other people? 
You can't go home from those experiences without saying, that's a place I want to work. Those are people I want to work with. And so as I had those experiences in those countries, it really became hard for me not to go back. And I took Howie to Sierra Leone one time, and he, he had a few experiences there he'd never had. And, um, you know, I always used to wonder when I was, you know, you asked him, he started traveling at 13, I used to always wonder, he would come home, sometimes he wouldn't talk to me much. And I, and I wasn't sure why. And I was worried that he was seeing too much, too fast, too difficult, you know, too extreme. And, and then, you know, Devin, my wife, would say, no, he's talking to me a little bit, he's okay. But, but it's, it's a tough world. And it really angers me when some, like the World Bank, you know, in 2008, they went from, well, you're poor if you live on a dollar a day. And then in 2008, somehow they decided you're poor if you live on a dollar 25. And then some economist sits there in a room somewhere and decides, well, this time we're gonna come out, we're gonna use a dollar 90, and man, do we have a good news story because the world got smaller for hungry people. I will tell you that the day they put that report out, and I'm in Congo, people are not eating better, they don't have more money to spend. It is really irritating to watch people take statistics and turn them into something so they can feel good or so you can feel that you succeeded at something. The truth is, it's a very tough world. There's four billion people that live out there that don't live like we live, that don't have clean water, that don't have enough food, that have kids dying from malnutrition, you know, whatever it is. And I have people who tell me, my friends, they say, Howie, you have to quit talking like that. That's a, that's a bad story. We did that in the 80s. That's over. We're going to be positive now. And it's like, you can change the narrative any way you want. And you can find pockets in the world where absolutely things have improved. No question about that. I would be the first to say that. <clears throat> but there are too many places in the world where things have not improved. And that's why we end up working. Because somebody should be there, and many other people are there. It's not just us. Um, in some cases, we're pretty lonely. In North Kivu, there's not a lot of people working there. But it is really frustrating to watch people use statistics to define poverty. I have to, I, I'll just give you one story. So I'm in uh, Benny, North Kivu, and I meet this farmer. And he says, you know, and this is through a translator, um, and he says, you know, some people used to tell me that I lived on a dollar a day and I was really poor. He says, I don't know if I lived on a dollar a day. I don't know what I lived on. I couldn't tell you. And that's the other part that we forget is this is not always defined in monetary terms like we would define it. And he says, now because of the cacao project, uh, and I was up there looking at something we were involved with that, he says, they tell me I make $5 a day. And um, actually, I think he said $7 a day. And he says, now they tell me I'm not in poverty anymore. And I said, well, how do you feel about that? And he says, well, things are a lot different. He says, I can buy my wife a dress. I can send my kids to school. And we eat at least two meals a day, sometimes three. So there's no question that his life improved. But he can't put that in a monetary term. He can't tell you whether that's a dollar or a change at $3, or where it changed. And so I always think about him when I hear this, you know, these magic numbers and these magic statistics that make something different in the world. Just like when Ghana in 2010 decided to increase their GDP by 60%, they went from a low-income country to a middle-income country. Go ask somebody on the street if their life changed that day. It didn't change, okay? So I think we have to be really careful about how we view statistics and the stories that people want to tell and how they want to present that. Because there are a lot of people in the world that should be living in better conditions and it takes a lot of resources and a lot of effort to find those solutions. So 
you'll find if you talk long enough with my dad, um, he is very much a realist. <laughs> that I talk too much, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he's very much a realist. But I think that um, in keeping in the name of the conference uh, and the subtitle of our book, that it's also OK to be realistic about hope and you know, not to be overly positive um, and to really talk about where there's opportunity to make change. And when you talk about the opportunity to invest in agriculture, well, what that really is for me, too, is, uh, and something for my father as well, is, is an opportunity to invest in women. When you look at the fact that 80% of the food grown in Africa uh, by smallholder farmers is being grown by women, and 70% of the food in Latin America and 60% of the food in Asia all being grown by women, when you talk about advancing agriculture, uh, you're really talking about uh, gender empowerment, gender inclusion, and looking at uh, a lot of human rights issues around women and the challenges that they face around the world. So you've got three quarters of the world's population that, uh, that is, uh, the three quarters of the world's population that is poor uh, is living in rural areas where agriculture is the primary activity. So we have an endless amount of work in front of us to do, but we also know that by focusing on agricultural development, which, by the way, is three times more effective at permanently lifting people out of poverty than any other kind of development, by focusing on agricultural development, we know we are directing our resources in an area that's going to make the biggest difference for the biggest number of people, especially the most disenfranchised people that you have all over the world. And so that's part of, that's kind of the hopeful end of the realistic message that, you know, we can continue to, to do a lot better. He's always cleaning up after me. <laughs> <laughs> One last question, and then we'll begin our questions from the floor. In the book, you talk about there being a, a wide spectrum of types of agriculture. Organic production systems, natural <laughs> production systems, high-intensity, you know, high low-intensity, smallholder. You know, there's a wide, wide spectrum of types of agricultural production. And you talk about how they're all important, and yet you talk about the challenge out there ahead in terms of feeding a growing global population, you know, the, the things we often talk about. And you, you contrast a little bit there are those different types. Mm. Talk about that a little bit, if you want to, in our last yeah. question. Get your questions ready. Um, well, I think that every, well, I won't say every, but a lot of different types of farming systems have something to offer. And truthfully, the ones that'll, that will end up finding it to be the most successful are ones that have probably merged things from, from all of them, or many of them. Um, I remember, you know, calling a guy named Tim LaSalle, he used to be, he was the uh, CEO of the Rodale Institute, which is, which is all organic. And he made some comment in a farm magazine where they quoted him, and I called him up and I said, I don't believe you're growing 220 bushel corn with no nitrogen, with no, no synthetic inputs. Come back and visit me. So I went back there, <clears throat> and I got a lesson. I learned a lot, and I realized that <clears throat> I didn't think that you could feed the world on organic agriculture, but the truth is, most, um, and there are people who would argue with me on that, and I'd be glad to debate them, but um, the, the most smaller farmers in Africa are, are organic by default, not because they're organic like right. we define it, not because they want to pay more for certain kinds of food grown a certain way. They are just, they don't have inputs. They don't have a lot of things that we have. So it's actually a huge opportunity in Africa to try to develop that agriculture differently than it was developed in India under the Green Revolution. It was developed in this country. And that is to take the, where they're at and include really important parts of what I call biological farming, and call it organic, and call it whatever you want, and incorporate that and combine it with the kind of farming that we know here. Uh, not that they're all going to have big John Deere tractors or something like that, but I just mean in terms of, of the way we do it. <coughs> and so I think the most successful farming system long term will be one that meets the three criteria that FAO puts out there which is minimal soil disturbance, permanent soil cover, and crop rotation. And then you can put through a whole lot of other things in there like nutrient management and water management and all those things. But if I'm a small farmer in Africa, I have to really worry about my half acre or whatever it is because pretty soon there won't be enough trees to go slash and burn to go to the next half acre when I've depleted my half acre here. There won't be enough. And there's a lot of countries where there's not enough today. In fact. I would argue in most cases there aren't, there is not. So wh what do you do? You have to increase productivity, but you want to do it in a way that um, you feel that in 10 generations you're still going to be able to be productive. 
You can't do that by simply using synthetic inputs, and I don't believe you can do it globally with, or, with strictly organic agriculture. I think it will take the best parts of both, and you can do it at scale. You just have to change your behavior. You just have to get better at what you do. You have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to adopt and get better educated and take a, you know, uh, take a little time to learn how to do something different. Um, so, you know, somebody comes up to me that's a friend of mine in Illinois that says, well, I tried no-till one time, it didn't work. And I said to him, I said, I don't think I put this in the book because I wouldn't let me. I said, well, is that what you said to your wife or your marriage? You tried it one year and it didn't work? I mean, you know, come on. What? I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that doesn't work in one year, and nothing on a farm works in one year. It works the same every year. So I said, come on. And, and, and I've had farm, farmers who, you know, have tried no-till, and they'll say, well, I, did, I tried to no-till my corn and my soybean. So I said, what kind of culture did you put on the planter? You didn't tell me I'd put a culture on the planter. Well, of course, you have to have the right tools to do the job. So, you know, this is a, a tough long-term challenge, but, but farmers in Africa, actually, if we can not, I mean, giving fertilizer to a smaller farmer who's poor is like giving heroin to somebody. I mean, it, it's like, it's addictive. It's like they're hooked on it. They're, they can't, they're never gonna change. So what we really need to do is go into it thinking, okay, let's think more long-term. Let's make sure that, that we, give them all the options and we teach them how to, to, to have a broader approach to agriculture. So, I mean, that's what I hope we can do. Mm. Howard? Well, I'll just follow up by saying, you know, your, your first question to me was kind of what, um, growing up and traveling with my dad, what, what did that really expose me to and, and allow me to observe and grow? We spent uh, countless numbers of days and hours with, with farmers all over the world and learning about their challenges and and, uh, and, and their hopes. And, um, and I think one thing that was always so interesting for me was when we would come home and we'd come back to Illinois or come back to Nebraska, and we would go and, and go on our own farm and start harvesting or planting whatever was going on at that time of the year. And, uh, and the one thing that always seemed so interesting about coming back and, and, and being in either Pena, Illinois, or being in Tecama uh, was really having that feeling and sense of community when you would get home and you would be out in the agricultural uh, operations that's going on anywhere else. And so as, as you talk about the importance of rural communities and this being a Rural Futures Conference, you know, I think that probably the greatest asset or greatest strength that rural communities have across the country, and part of what makes the fabric of America so great, is the fact that you have got these senses of community that's all over the place, where people will step up and lend a helping hand or watch out for someone else, and it just creates a sense of family that I think doesn't necessarily exist in a lot of urban neighborhoods or other places around the country that really benefits you know, the, the values and the principles of the United States and what I think will continue to make us stand out you know, for years to come. I, I, I have to say that this conference and conferences like it are probably the most important thing happening in America today. Um, we built this country hmm. from rural America up. A lot of the population today wouldn't even know what you're talking about if you said that to them. Um, Chuck Housebrook used to, we used to have some great con conversations. He would challenge me on things and give me ideas. Um, and the truth is, if there's one thing in America that I watch, and I have watched for the last three decades with a really disappointing view, because America is an incredible country. This is you know, a great country. But we have allowed rural America to slip. And we've done that in policies in Washington. We've done it with different presidents that have allowed consolidation to take place without really the proper care. And I'm not targeting that at any particular company or industry. It's just happened over time. And when your school closes in your, in your town, that hurts. And when your tax base gets eroded, you don't get the same services that you used to have. And the political game is stacked against us in many ways in Washington. So when I say this is one of the most important things happening in America, I'm serious because Rural America has to survive and stay strong, and it's the people sitting in this room and the people coming to this conference 
that can do that. Nobody else is going to do it for us. That's a great end. Yeah. So I know we have mics at the, on the sides, so if you would get your hand up in the air if you have a question that you'd like to address to our, our speakers, please get the mic here. Chuck Hasselbrook over here on the center. Chuck, you can't ask us a trick question. Don't do that. <laughs> See, they uh, won't give you a microphone. Yeah. Just in case you need it. <laughs> Yell it out out here. So to get to give our viewers, make sure they hear uh, the question. Uh, the question is, what is the most successful investment in ag development that you've seen work? Is that right, Chuck? I would actually say not much. After <clears throat> several hundred million dollars, I would say we've not had the kind of success we should have. Now, to be fair about that, we work in really, really tough places most of the time. It's why we changed gears and decided to try something different in Rwanda. So if you wanted to ask me what I th think in the future will be our biggest success, it's going to be the student city here. It's going to be the kids, I call, anybody under 30 is a kid to me. Well, <laughs> under 40 now, but, um, but Alan, that doesn't count you. Um, but, you know, it's, it's that generation. It's that generation that is going to figure out how you solve the biggest problems we've ever faced. And have we had a lot of problems that have been reduced and a lot of things solved? Absolutely we have, but that doesn't take away from what a lot of people face today. And so I think it's the next generation that's gonna come up and you know, um, they're gonna face some tough challenges. But, but I think you know, these kids are here, sorry I don't mean kids like, you know, I know you're young adults, but you know, they're here to learn about agriculture. And, and, and we're gonna send a couple hundred uh, young adults here and and hopefully more and and I will say the university has done th this university has done a better job of any other university we would talk to to make this program work and we we're really proud to do it with Nebraska and they really showed leadership they really you know stepped up to the plate when we, when we had to figure out how do we do this and how do we do it the most efficient way and the best way and and with a number of students so when I look at it, I just think that's where my hope is for the future, is that it took us a lot of money. And I mean, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, would I fund 200 or 300 students at any university? I would say, absolutely not, okay? I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Today, it's probably one of the cornerstones of what we hope will be successful. Well, it isn't probably, it is one of the cornerstones of what we hope is successful in Rwanda as a model that can be used and replicated. I mean, what we've got to do is get one country that in Africa that gets most of it right, and we have to we have to keep working at that. And 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 then you know one of those components has to be agriculture. It cannot be successful. There is no country in the world that is independent and feeds itself and has done well without agriculture being strong. And so. That is the key at the end of the day. I mean, you can't, there's a whole lot of other pieces to it, as you know, but I mean, that is absolutely a key. I think there's a question here with Amber. Oh, hi. Um, thank you both for, for coming. Uh, I come from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And question for both of you of the Howard G. Buffett Foundation. One of the focuses is on water security. Uh, recently in California with the drought, Nestle Corporation has sort of got it, gotten itself in trouble for pumping water for the resale market, and people have started a conversation on whether you see water as a commodity uh, to be sold, or is it a human right, or is it a gray area in between, and, and what do we do going forward? The tragedy of the commons, but is more, okay. yeah, more appropriate. I mean, I think that... Um, Oh boy, I uh, could get into a lot of trouble answering this in a couple of different ways, but um, I'll, I'll say simply that um, like our 
challenges with fresh air that we're facing today. You know, we, gosh, I don't know how to say this politically correct. I'll turn it over to you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Well done. He's the, he's the safe one in the family. You can see that. He wasn't with me three weeks ago. Yeah. Um, That's true. I think that there's a certain amount of human greed that always finds its place, no matter what you're talking about. So there will be people and companies who find a way to make water, water a profit center and they will find ways to exploit it in situations like you're talking about where it's, it, it, it's uh, becoming a commodity because you attach a financial value to it and that will make it a commodity. Um, there's not there's not a lot that I can say about how you solve it, except I would say that, you know, a little different situation is in Des Moines, Iowa, where the water company is suing farmers, and that's fixable, okay? We can't make it rain when we want it to rain unless you could buy a pivot, but you can't, you know, the world doesn't operate under pivot, but it does allow, that is fixable if we change our farming behavior, and there's, 50 different things you can do that work. So where it becomes a regulatory issue, farmers will change faster. And I would hope that we can change it as farmers without regulation because that never works the best. But, you know, in California, it's an extreme example yeah. uh, right now. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine if, if, if people started boxing up oxygen and selling that? So, I mean, it's just... It, he tried that once when he was a kid, but it didn't work. <laughs> he said, I have a better idea than lemonade stands, but it didn't So I see lots of hands. There's a question waiting at the very top, and then we'll come back now. Like, Roger, you had one, and Richard, you had one. Got a two-part question. Uh, in America, 40% of what we plant uh, never makes it to the table. Mm -hmm. Of that 40%, 20% never makes it off the farm in the first place. First, how do we address that issue? Uh, in America, and number two, have you seen those same types of numbers internationally? <laughs> what was the first part of the question? Well, the first food part waste. It, what? Food waste. Yeah, right. food waste. I never seen waste. that. Well, the first thing when I talk about food waste is I think about we have a totally failing H2A system, yeah. we, which means we have a totally failing system to bring in people from out of this country to work, and it has gotten caught up in emotion and politics that is going to hurt this country long term in a big way. Um, we decided <clears throat> um, to, uh, this is just me, I got to learn it the hard way. So we took our farm in Arizona and I said, Doug, you got to hire two guys through the H2A program. I want to really understand. <coughs> yeah, that's no big deal. Well, he would tell you it's a big deal now. Um, so he first goes to the state and gets a permit. And I, I'm going to answer the heart of your question, but uh, this, this is a big part of, of the problem. Um, and he gets a permit. Then he goes to the fe federal government and he gets a permit. And he goes back to the state and they tell him he has to advertise for U.S. workers <clears throat> in California, Nevada, New Mexico, and Arizona. So he advertises, nobody answers. So he wants them for September 1st. Now the key is that we don't know if we, can, we need them from September 1st to September 30th, but the way our system works is those are the dates you hire them, those are the dates you get them. So if I were growing cantaloupes and oranges and a bunch of other stuff, and I hire them for cantaloupes, and they come, and my cantaloupes aren't ready, but I need to pick my oranges, I can't take my cantaloupe guys from the H2A and put them on the oranges because they don't allow it. So it's, it, it's got these very rigid rules. So then I asked, I called them up the other day. I said, Doug, you never told me what happened on the H2A guys. And he says, God, I was hoping you'd forget about it. I said, well, I'm not going to forget about it. He goes... Um, September 1st came and I called the guy back that, that was going to bring him to us in the U.S. And I said, where are our two guys? Um, and not a single applicant from a United States citizen, okay, in four states where we advertise. And, and then, but, but if you have two people from somewhere else and on September 4th, three days into the job, an American shows up, you have to send one of those people home, hire the American, and then when they quit in two days because it's too hard, 
you're screwed. Okay, great system. So um, now it's like, well, where are our two guys? And Doug says, well, I called the guy that was going to bring them through uh, to us, and he says, well, who's your agent in Mexico? And Doug says, I didn't know I needed an agent in Mexico, so we're going to start over and try it again next year. But anyway, it is so cumbersome to legally hire people that if you look across the state, and here's what people don't realize, from there's every state in this country uses labor on the farm, whether it's onions in Georgia or cherries in Michigan or um, sugar beets or something different in western Nebraska. I mean, every state uses it. So when I think about agricultural waste, I don't think about me running a combine across cornfields and soybeans because I get most of that, and if you treat it right, it gets to where it's going. I think about the amount of waste that comes from the fact that we cannot get our act together, and I'm not going to say on immigration because that's a way more complicated issue, but we cannot get our act together on how to bring in qualified, skilled labor into this country to support our U.S. farmers mm. when they need them. And it's a big problem, and it's only going to get bigger because I don't see anybody with the guts to stand up and fix it. So that's my answer because until you fix the political system that ha and the emotions that have created a whole different environment and dynamics for bringing in that labor, you're going to continue to see huge amounts of waste across this country. And most of it's in fruits and vegetables. It's not in the cornfields in Nebraska. True. No, that, way, that was a two-part question. The second part was on the international side, and the quick answer is yes, the amounts of food spoilage, rotting, and hunger that exists because of uh, loss of food is, is off the charts. And that is corn and beans. Yeah, that's, and everything. that's everything. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but one, uh, one short anecdote is uh, in Chapter 29, we talk about the work we did in Afghanistan, and uh, one of them was some uh, just totally rudimentary uh, cool, dry storage, dry storage, it sounds like a refrigerator. No, it's just a hole in the ground that's covered for potatoes for a potato farmer in Bamiyan province and completely transformed their life. Completely transformed their life. One little hole in the ground that's covered with just the right things to make sure that the potatoes don't spoil. So you're, the bar is extremely low when it comes to addressing food spoilage uh, on the international uh, side. And that's before you get to the the waste on the plate. Yeah, that's step one. The, and then the, you have the entire the value chain that doesn't, yeah, we don't even get time for that. Yep. So we're going to go to Roger Werbein up here has a question. We're going to do three more. So uh, Roger, just yell your question out if you would. I, I think I know the answer to your, to your question, but based on your worldwide in, uh, understanding, what do you consider the biggest risk to American agriculture in the future? So to repeat the question, uh, given you know, your experience internationally and your global understanding, what do you think the biggest risk is to American agriculture in the future? <laughs> government. I think that was a government. Was government. Hey, <laughs> Washington, D.C., <laughs> government. Um, and farmers who won't change behavior. So we can control one of them much better than we can the other one. But we have soil erosion today that's as bad as the 1930s. You just don't see it because we can cover it up with great big equipment. And um, so, you know, farmers have to change, and there are solutions to this, and there's answers to this, and there are even things in place today that could help them do that. If they would actually fund conservation programs instead of, you know, if they would actually give them money, you know, farmers would do a lot more. Um, if they equip program really had money in it that was significant for changing, you know, how farmers are able to do things, more farmers would do it. it, it this is government driven. Anything at scale is government driven. You can't, you can't fix, correct, change, or start anything in agriculture if the government isn't behind it. Because it's going to be the money and it's going to be the policy. And you can't beat those two things no matter how hard you try. And the second part of the answer to, is what I answered earlier. If we, we, we have a system today, you can walk in, you, you can walk in most communities in a, in a couple of mile radius and go into three or four or five different supermarkets. And you have a huge array of all this fresh vegetables 
and, and, and um, you know, fruits and all these things that you can select from. And they're affordable and they're safe. And there's diversity in what you can buy. Those three things are at stake for this country if we can't figure out how to put together a workforce. Because I will tell you, it is absolutely false when people talk about, oh, Americans will do that. Go down to Yuma, Arizona and walk out into one of those fields. I've done it a hundred times. And walk out one of those fields. You won't find an American, but yet to hire those people, you have to advertise everywhere that they think an American will come from. And if you go out and stand in that field, you won't last one afternoon picking vegetables. So the truth is, we don't want to do that work. And that's OK if we have a system that supports our food industry that we have today. But we're going to lose that if we don't do better at that. And it's something that most people could care less about. They don't care until they can't buy oranges or that you know, oranges become five times the price. Or somebody starts getting sick because some pesticide was used somewhere because there's no EPA or FDA to regulate it because it's coming from some other country. So, you know, people don't care until they go, whoa, this is, I mean, I'm affected by it. You know, it's impacting me. So, you know, that is a huge, huge issue that just people don't either understand or care about. And it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. I mean, we, we, I, I, it's a part where we spend a lot of our time uh, working on, aside from a lot of what you've heard us talk about, and it's a big deal. So, Ronnie, only 30, wait, 30 seconds on, I just yeah. want to say, I think building on that, just the disconnect between the values <laughs> in rural communities and what Howard's talking about in terms of people not understanding where their food's coming from, what goes into that process, practices that need to be changed, all the way down the food chain. That disconnect is going to be one of the dangerous things we have because then it goes all the way up to policymakers in Washington and all the way back down effectively to the rural communities that you know are suffering as a result. So we're going to take Jordan, your question on the left, and we'll end up with Chuck Schroeder, fittingly, with our last question for the day. Hi, my name is Sarah Schellpepper, and thinking back on my classes and international experiences, when you guys work abroad, how do you work with government and culture when creating programs so that you don't disturb the society or the economy? Mm -hmm. You got to repeat that again. I had a little trouble hearing. So you, can you repeat it again for for Mr. Buffett? Okay. I'm I'm old. I can't hear. I can't see. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's when I get Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> when you choose to work abroad, how do you work with government and culture when creating a program that will not disrupt society or the local economy? Well. We work with very few governments because we find it a waste of time. Um, and it's true. I mean, it, it, if, if, if we spent our time working with governments, we'd get nothing done in most cases. Obviously, I already explained that's why we're in Rwanda, because we believe in the government, and we can depend on the government and what they say and what they do. Um, Talk about P for P. P for P would be the best example, I think, Purchase for Progress. Well, go ahead. Okay, well, I, I mean, I think you know, one of the programs, I didn't mean to interrupt, sorry, I thought oh, you'd no. want to run with that, but. I'm used to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we highlight this in, in a chapter that's called Buy Local, and uh, it really talks about how there are a number of international uh, aid programs that have been set up that um, inadvertently do exactly what you're saying, which is to destroy local economies um, around dumping food aid and destroying prices for local farmers. And part of what we've tried to do is, is, is work with the UN World Food Program and with some governments through them, not us directly usually, on making sure that a lot of those programs don't continue to, to, to cause a lot of suffering in the, in the way that they've been designed. I'm sorry. The, the worst program that policymakers ever invented was monetization. Yeah. Because we take our commodities and we go over and sell them in a place where farmers already struggle in marketplaces have a difficult time, and then we dump those commodities onto the local market and sell them so that a U.S. NGO can pay U.S. people salaries in that country. It is, a, it is beyond a bad idea. And I have seen a lot of farmers and people, and, and people in marketplaces in the value chain suffer from that. It might be very clever, but clever ideas aren't always good ideas. <laughs> and so, um, 
when you talk about having a negative impact on culture, it's those kinds of decisions that work for you, but they don't work for the people that you are supposedly trying to help. And so you do more damage with your clever idea than what you do uh, as an end result of what that money brings. I don't know if that answered it. I, hmm. but. And our last question, Chuck Schroeder. Well, number one, let me say that uh, your message, realistic message about the importance of rural communities uh, could not have been a more profound statement to kick off this conference and I'm deeply grateful for that. Number two, as I think about the evolution of your focus from agriculture to food to conflict resolution, it, it strikes me that uh, it has great importance to those of us trying to build strong, vital rural communities in this country as well. There are interesting parallels. As you take the work of your foundation into areas of conflict and poverty, food shortages, um, it seems to me that while indeed while you might focus on practices and technologies, uh, both of you are a force of nature in your own style, but uh, the critically important thing is the leadership that you would leave behind there that can carry forward sound practices and leadership in their communities, drawing people together to do the things that you're trying to teach them to do. How do you find those leaders? How do you invest in their development for long-term sustainability? That's tough. Well, um, leaders, and they don't have to be well-known, and they don't have to be somebody you've read about, but, but leaders tend to evolve. They, t they tend to surface, and so, it's, it's a hit and miss thing because you bet, you're betting on people and some of those bets are gonna be wrong. But there's no other, there's no scientific way I know of to do it. It's way more of an art than it is a science. And so, you know, we're investing 150 million, well more than that, 200 million dollars in one area based on one person that we have confidence in. That's a terrible strategy. I mean, it's terrible. You know, they tried to kill him last year. They hit him with two rounds from an AK-47, and he's walking around just fine, but that doesn't usually happen when you get hit with two rounds. So it's a terrible strategy, but it's the willingness to take the risk to do it. But this guy is changing things that no one's ever had the guts to try or or the wherewithal to do it. So, you know, it's, it's a bet. And, and um, the way you keep it going is through, and anybody who knows me will know, um, Todd Sneller particularly is here. He'll, he'll know that I, I am like, I, I usually get kicked off every university campus <laughs> I go to because I'm kind of anti-academic. But, but, but so for me to be saying, <laughs> For, for me, for me to, between us. I save that for the very end. Um, but but there's a lot of context that I'd have to explain. But practical and applied, later. and yeah, that's the yeah. album. But but the the truth is that that we have to do the things we're doing with the University of Nebraska with the Rwandan students. We have to find ways to do that more often in effective ways. And, and, and provide those people who have the skills and the desire to be leaders, to help them be leaders. And, you know, it's not, it's not you don't go boom, you're a leader, you know. That comes from life lessons. It comes from understanding judgment and, and um, reading people and taking some risk and doing things. I mean, it comes from all sorts of, no, no one just gets born as a leader. They might have the qualities to be a leader, but you have to pull that out. You have to give them the resources to pull that out of themselves. So, you know, I, I will send more kids to college in the future when I would have told you I would never have done that because that is a way to give them the resources to pull the leadership out of them. And that's gonna be a really important thing going forward in the countries where we work because it is a total lack of leadership that often, not everywhere, but many places, is what prevents anybody from changing anything. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, 
And leadership in a conflict area is a lot different than leadership in Washington, D.C. So you have to have different people with different ideas, different skills, different tolerances for different things. And so, you know, it's a very tough thing to do, and we'll, we'll make some bad bets, but we've made some really good bets, too. And, you know, if you look at Rwanda, I'm betting on President Kagame. I'm betting that this guy will take what he's done in the last 20 years and take it forward in the next 20 years. That doesn't mean it's going to look exactly the same. It just means you've got a leader and somebody who's willing to take the risk and take the chances. So even though I made that statement, I think I made up for it by saying that I'll send more kids to school. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some definitely to Lincoln. But anyway, I mean, it's just, you're... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that, it, it's, it, you know, you, you have to help people be leaders. You can't just expect them, are there some born leaders like Martin Luther King or somebody? I mean, who knows what it took for him to have the, the guts and, and, and to be able to stand up there and do what somebody like that did. I mean, we don't know that story. We just know how we've seen him. But that couldn't have been, you know, he didn't just get up one day and say, I'm going to be a leader. So we have, we have to help people be leaders. And on that great ending note, please join me in thanking Howard and Howard Buffett for a great night. Our, tr our tradition with the Hearman lectures, lectures is always to give our lecturers a memento for them to remember the occasion of coming to the University of Nebraska and being a Hearman lecturer. Uh, it features the Tree of Life, which is much of what we're talking about here related to agriculture. So Howard, thank you very much. Thank you very much. For coming and being with I, us. I thought maybe it was a gold bar. Hey. <laughs> but, you know, and Dr. Howard, thank, thank you so you much. much. Thank you.